Well, amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Beautiful day yesterday. Beautiful rain. Cooled everything down. It's wonderful, right? Amen. Amen. Why don't we go before the Lord in prayer? Father, we just uh, glorify you this morning, or this afternoon. Father, we thank you, Lord God. Lord, I thank you, Lord. I'm awake. Praise you, Lord God, that you're, that you're here and your presence, Lord God, is so welcome, Lord, just to invade our life, Lord, to do, Lord, what you want to do. We yield ourselves to you. We give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Say hello to somebody new real fast. You can wave hi.
Pastor Zach makes his way on up. Father, we just ask you, Lord God, that you would bless the gift and the giver, Father, as they give to you. Lord, that they would prosper, Lord, where they are. Lord God, that they would prosper in their soul. But Father, most of all, Lord, that they would prosper in the sharing of the gospel with those that they know that are lost. We ask you, Lord God, Lord, give them confidence and boldness. Lord, as you said, as we sang right now, Lord God, your love never fails, Lord. Your love, Lord, your perfect love casts out all fear, Father. There's not a time and an instance, Lord God, where, where we don't deal with the aspects of our fear when we address people with the gospel. But I ask you, Lord God, that your love would override all of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Pastor Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Covenant Christian Center International. My name is Pastor Zachary Paul. I am the youth pastor here. Uh, I have three announcements for you. So the first one is the youth group, the youth, uh, Purpose Driven Youth here, will be starting next week, Thursday. So praise God. Woo! So with that, invite your friends, invite any youth that you know from grades 6 to grades 12. We will be meeting in the back left room of this building here Thursday, right after worship. We will be going around and, you know, going over there. So thank you. Next announcement is Father's Day is approaching and our wonderful father of the house, we want to bless him. So keep in mind, uh, a special love offering would be greatly appreciated. Uh, extra, extra large. Hot pink. No, no hot pink. Red. Okay, and guitar straps and strings are always cool too. Yeah. Last announcement is I want to spit a special thank you to our sound and audio live streaming people back there. Thank you for stepping in and filling in the gaps. I wanted to uh, open the invitation to other people learning the equipment as well. Um, it can't just be them, you know, if something happens, God forbid. We need some other people. So if you feel called to minister to those on live stream, if you will feel led to post lyrics and Bible verses on the screen or help Randy out on the camera. He needs an off day, he's always back there. So please feel free to contact me or my wife who is very pregnant back there in the corner. Uh, yeah, so thank you, God bless you all. And welcome Apostle Osterbein. My wife sends her regards, she's uh taken ill. No, it's not COVID. Um, I think it's really just the allergies. How many people have been having trouble with the allergies? And the, Yeah, so I think it kind of got to her a bit. And So she is not with us, but she sends her regards and is watching online. Praise the Lord. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord God, that you're bringing through a transition to this church that is taking us into new levels with you. And so, Lord, we thank you so much for your hand of provision, your hand of protection over those that are here. We ask, God, that you would bless, Lord God, those that are governing. We ask for wisdom. We pray for godly government. We pray for our nation. Lord God, we pray for our communities. We pray for our families. God, we are desperate for a move, and so we know that we are on the precipice of such move, and we ask that you prepare us, Lord God, that we would be able to rise to the occasion before us, that souls would be saved. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Last week we spoke about unforgiveness. We're going to continue on this series. I think it's rather apropos. Um, we said last week that unforgiveness is the one thing above all else that will keep us from coming to the fullness of Christ. People who want to be successful in life, you cannot be successful holding on to unforgiveness. It eventually will wear you down. When we first started this church, we had a young lady at our church who was about 85 
pounds. And so I used her as an example. And I brought in probably about 80 pounds of rock. And I had a large uh, hiking backpack that I had. And I was showing the example of how people will take an offense. We're all trying to get to the top of a mountain. And in the process, there are some people ahead of us. And perhaps they kick down a rock and accidentally or on purpose, they hit us in the head. So we pick up the rock and we say to ourselves, we're going to get even with them. So we put it in the pack. And when we figure that when we catch up to them, we're going to hit them with the rock and we're going to pay them back for what they did. In the process of time, though, you get hit by another rock. So you pick up that rock and you would put it in your backpack and you say, well, I'm, when I get even with that person, then I'm going to hit them with that rock. And then eventually you get hit with another rock and slowly you find that the people who offended you go on to advance and you're so weighted down with all of the things that you're going to get them back with that you cannot climb the mountain. And so when I was done with her, the poor girl was 80 pounds. I put 80 pounds of bricks into, into her pack, and she's 85 pounds, and she was really having a hard time standing. I had to preach very quickly, lest, of course, we damage her. But the point is, is that's what happens when you don't forgive. You literally weigh yourself down, and you're keeping yourself from moving forward in life. So we looked at Ephesians 4, and we said, of course, where it says that God gave apostles, pastors, prophets, teachers, and evangelists for the perfecting of the faith, that they can all come into the fullness of Christ. Say fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ is very important that we understand that you are not called just to be saved. You are not just called to avoid hell. You are not just called to um, you know, come to church. There is a fullness. There's a process. God's investment in you is such that God is a good businessman. And if he's going to take something as valuable as himself in his son and have him, of course, crucified for us, he expects something for that investment. Nobody just spends money willy-nilly when you come up to higher levels. You see, Mr. Buffett um, is a man who's very wealthy, and he doesn't just throw his money around. Um, he doesn't waste it on certain things. The wealthier you are, the more you appreciate your wealth and your ability to procure wealth. Now, God, of course, is so wealthy that he owns a cattle on a thousand hills, and he collects stars for fun. And so he invested in you and expects, because he's a businessman, he expects you to come to a fullness. There's supposed to be a benefit for his investment, and that investment is coming into the fullness of Christ. And so it's my my job as an apostle, as a pastor, uh, to bring you into this fullness of Christ, to be conformed into his image. And we know that Jesus fulfilled the fullness of who he was as Christ, not just as Jesus, but as Christ, because he's focusing here on a very key factor. The question is, why did Christ come? Well, Christ came so that, of course, we could be reconciled, say reconciled, back to God. In order to do that, that involves something called forgiveness. So his purpose, the fullness of Jesus becoming Christ, because he wasn't Christ until after, of course, he was on the cross. He carried within him the Christ aspect, just like um, my niece over here carries within her the potentials of being a mother, but not until she goes to the scrutiny of her uncle, in which I might allow the guy to live, and then, of course, marry her off, at which time she may have a baby, as long as we don't think about what she's doing to get there. So the point is in all of that, that's how the natural nature of the beast is, and that's how it works. But she will have within her the potentials to be a mother, but those potentialities are not fulfilled yet, and we're going to keep it that way for a very long time, if her dad has any say. So my point is, is that she's going to come into a fullness after a process. So Jesus comes into the fullness of who he was as Christ, he became Christ, which was the fullness of Jesus' purpose, and it was to reconcile through forgiveness. So forgiveness is key to coming into the fullness of Christ. And God gave apostles, pastors, prophets, teachers to help you come into the fullness of Christ or assist you in forgiving. Are you with me? So this was fulfilled when Christ uttered, his last words, Father, forgive them, in Luke 23, 34, thus fulfilling his calling as Christ. Now turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5, 18. If I'm talking a little fast, it's because I want to kind of lay down a foundation to where we're going to be going. 2 Corinthians 5, I said 18, right? Yes, I did. One of these days we're going to get modern and and, and learn how to actually put it up on the board thing and everything, and I'm going to learn PowerPoint. Right. It says, now all these things are from God, who reconciled, 
himself or us to himself through Christ. See that reconciliation thing again? And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So not only did Jesus reconcile us to the Father, but then he said, now it's your job to go and do the same. Okay, so part of your responsibility in coming into the fullness of Christ is to do the things that Jesus did. You know, back in the early 2000s, we wore those little straps. What would Jesus do? Everybody thought that was so cool. I always thought it was kind of an admittance of some ignorance. Like if you don't know, then that means you're probably not reading your Bible very much. (laughs) Anyways, it was a thing. And uh, people asked, what would Jesus do? You shouldn't really have to ask. If you're a Christian, you should know. And that's why you study your show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth according to Scripture. You should know what Jesus would do. And one of the things that Jesus always did, because that's why he came, was live in a position of forgiveness. You cannot call yourself a Christian and hold bitterness against somebody. You know, a lot of people give me a hard time. They're like, you've got to quit telling people they're not saved when they're doing things that the Bible says is not what saved people do. What? Yeah, people are going to get discouraged. You want to give them a false sense of salvation so they can find out when they get to heaven they never really were and end up in hell. Not my job. My job is to show you how to get there. And certain aspects are not allowed. There are parameters. And one of them is holding unforgiveness. You're not allowed to hold unforgiveness. And you even curse yourself when you pray the Our Father because you say, Father, forgive them. What? As I forgive them. Right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's for the Catholics. Forgive us our sins if you're Protestant. Lutherans, I think, say the same. If you don't forgive, then God won't forgive you. It is really that simple. It's not an option. Well, I've been through some things. I'm sure you have. Was it harder than hanging on the cross for the sins of the world? Then I'm sorry, you have no excuse. You have no comparative. You have nothing to say. Well, I don't see them being punished for what they did. Uh, The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And God's payment is always better than your payment. I've always said that vengeance is a funny thing. I've said this before. Vengeance is like taking a whole vat full of acid and throwing it into somebody's face to get even with them. The problem is you have to burn your own hands in order for them to be burned in the face. So you jack yourself up to get them. You put more rocks, and then they advance. So there's no option here. Well, uh, they hurt me, and that's, I understand that. But God will deal with them. Well, God moves very slowly. Yes, he does. But the Bible says you reap what you sow. What goes around comes around. That is just a fact. If you live long enough on this planet, you will see it happen to people. But it shouldn't come from your hands because you burn yourself in the process. So, he goes on to say in verse 19, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So God was inside of Christ reconciling himself, not counting your sins against you, He has committed also to us the word of reconciliation. Now, this is an interesting thing. The word of reconciliation. So we have the words of how to teach people to forgive. Christ's directives on forgiveness. There is actually a protocol for this. To fulfill the ministry of reconciliation. Are you with me? Now, what's interesting is the word reconcile is a political or a legal term. What is the word katalasso? Say that with me. Katalasso. That's Greek to me. In that it refers to dispute resolution. People say, well, 
what's this whole thing with being saved? Why is that so important? I'm a good person. No, you're not. You're all going to go to hell if it wasn't for Jesus. Just going to be honest with you. A couple of things are guarantees. Taxes, death, and hell for those who aren't saved. You can believe it. You cannot believe it. You can wear a mask and have social distancing. You're still going to go. Because, see, the person who sins shall surely die. So as soon as you sin once, you are exactly marked for hell. That's the nature of the beast. That's why pastors are pastors, why, why Christians witness, why we're so intense about it, because you're damned. We're not judging you as Christians. We're just simply saying the judgment's already been passed. The man who sins shall surely die. Done. There's nothing to discuss. Well, I don't think that I'll go to hell. Well, you can think you won't die either, but the cemeteries are full of people who thought that. You will die, you will go to hell if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's nothing to discuss past that. There's no, well, no, that's it. You say, well, my sins don't really deserve hell. Well, you have to understand that this is a pure white board and with no eraser. So I'll use my hand. Look at the power I have. Look at that. Now, you can see it's, it's uh, sort of white, but it's a pure white board. Your sin may be just that, but is that enough to, of course, negate the fact that this is now not a pure white board? It's no longer white. Just your little thin. It's all it takes, just one. Now, God says all sin is the same. So if it's all the same, your little sin of whatever, pick one that you, is your pet, is the same as murder. So how many times do you have to murder to be a murderer? That's it. What happens if you're a murderer? Technically, and you get caught. You go to prison. What happens if you sin against God? You go to hell. This is the end of the story. That's it. The end. There is nothing in between. So Jesus said, hold it. I'll pay that debt. Now, if you appreciate the fact that he paid that debt, then you're going to say, well, I want to be like him. If you do not want to be like Jesus after he paid that debt, I question if you're like Jesus. You can't be saved and say, I am a Christian and not do the things that Jesus did because Christian means small Christ. So if you're not doing what he did, which was forgiving, then you're not a Christian. This is simple deduction. A, therefore, B. Did anyone have that? Do they still teach that in college? Or is it just open to conjecture? You know, it's be what you want to be today. That's common core. Two plus two is whatever you feel. So we said before that church is to be a governing body. And if we're looking at Catalasso, we're looking to reconcile, then the ecclesia, the senate, the ambassadorial representative body, the church, is actually a legal entity that works for the king who says we must Catalasso the discrepancy that is caused by sin. We then go in and say and tell people what he did. We say, you don't have to go to hell. You're going to go, but you don't have to. All you need to do is allow him to become you and you to become him. To bring him into you, and then, of course, you look to be conformed into his image. To do that, you have to do the things that he did. And what did he do? He forgave. Are you with me? Am I going too fast for anyone? I know you all haven't sat in church in a while. I don't want to go too fast. So follow me. As ambassadors, we're to look to reconcile people to God first and foremost through an invitation to accept Jesus Christ and what he did for them on the cross because he died for everyone. 
This is not an exclusive club. It's an inclusive club, but you have to be in the club. Are you following me? You must join the family of God. Matthew 28, Mark 16. Look them up. Then we're to assist him in reconciling amongst the people towards each other in the church. When there's a discrepancy in the church, we're to broker that situation so we all are speaking together one thing. That's why you celebrate common union, communion. If there is a discrepancy between people and people are arguing with people within, within the church and people have problems with people in the church, then they are to not take communion because now you're being a liar and you must go to that person that you have a problem with or they're to come to you. And you handle that before you take in the communion because when you take in the communion, the Bible says that if you do this, you can literally bring a curse upon yourself to the point of death. I won't allow your faces to, of course, dictate to me that you haven't been studying during this COVID time. You should have had a lot of, you should have this down. You guys should be like, I am so already ahead of you on what you're saying. Yes, I see that hand in the back. You, sir, in the blue shirt. Why don't you read it just for fun so that we, you know, because they think I might have made this up because I've been cooped up in the house or something. Stand up and, 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 and enunciate in your best Alexander Scorby, please. So that's a lot of words that says, if you eat it with unforgiveness, you bring upon the curse of death or sickness upon yourself. Now, I know there have been people who don't agree with me that God would never allow a curse to come on you once you're saved, but <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, that's what the book says. I didn't write it, trust me. I would edit the book myself. Pastors would, of course, receive 50% tithe. But the point is, Wow, some people have no sense of humor today. What are you, a little, a little, it was a joke, relax. What, have you been cooped up in your house for the last three months? Why is God so intense on this? Well, communion is interesting because communion is on par in the third dimension to intercourse. And no, I don't mean talking. If you read what it says, it takes my body into you, right? And blood is shed. Back when they had these things called virgins, that's what happens when you have sex the first time. The reason why God built a woman the way he did when she's a virgin and that to be broken is so that blood will be shed because you're forming a blood covenant. Jesus on the cross bled out all of his blood because it is a blood covenant, and that's a whole new message. But that is what's happening. So you're technically having intimacy with God when you take communion as the body of Christ. But if the body is bifurcated, then it is disconnected and you have polluted the beauty of the intercourse. Is this too grown up for anybody? We'll break it down. I mean, it is what it is. Take his body into your body. I don't need to explain this to you. I mean, everyone's over at least... 10 by now. I think they teach it now when they're 10 or 5. I don't know what it is. It's sex ed to 5-year-olds. That's a smart move. Why? Intimacy is what God's all about. Okay? Jesus is coming back for his bride. His bride is the church. That means if you're not in a church, you're not a part of the bride. There are no lone wolf Christians. I'm going to follow Jesus, but I'm not going to be a part of the church because there's too many hypocrites there. Yet you'll go to a hospital full of sick people and expect to get better. This is kind of a hospital, so you're going to find sick people here at different levels of health. Okay? First of all, you have to realize you're a mess. So maybe that's the first part you should realize. Maybe they don't want to be around you because you're a hot mess. Okay, everybody thinks they've got it going on, and I've never been really impressed with people. I don't. Anyways, my point is, we need 
to be a part of a church. That's why God established the church. Why he says, come together. And even all the more as you see the day of his return coming. Why would you need to come into church more and not less? Because things outside of the church are going to get worse that will leave an effect on you. The more you swim in a sewer, the more you're going to get saturated with the funk. So by coming here, the Bible says that men are to wash their wives with the watering of the word to wash them. So the more you hear the word preached, the more you're being washed of the funk of what's going on out there, of the pollution. So by coming together and hearing the word, you're being washed. Are you following me? Because Pastor Chuck will read all these scripture verses every five minutes and we'll never get anywhere, but he will back up what I'm saying. Okay, he actually reads that book too. So, why is it that people complain that a church service goes too long? Only little kids complain about having to take a bath. They get used to the funk. Until when? When do boys start bathing? When girls become a priority. Otherwise, they're little pigs. They won't wear deodorant. We won't bathe. We won't brush our teeth. Okay? Males are pigs until it's breeding season. Then we got deodorant. We're brushing our teeth. We're bathing every five seconds. We're covering up our zits with girl makeup and pretending that's not. Why? Because our minds now are changing. If you're a part of the church, your mind should be changing towards the return of Christ and you should, because he's coming back for his bride which is, which is without spot or wrinkle. In other words, she's not dirty. She's looking to clean herself up for the groom. Are you following me? So if the church service goes long, odds are God had me preach long because you got that dirty. And maybe because you've been in the world and what was going on, you got accustomed to the funk because everybody else stunk the same. See, you become nose deaf. Okay? Who knows what I'm talking about? How many people, or blind, nose blind, how many people, you're around those people, and boy, you're, you're wondering what they ate. You just looking at him, you're like, you can't smell that, bro. Okay? Mm. And they stink, and they're cool with their own stink because they become accustomed to the funk. And now, if you're in a room full of everybody funky, I talked with some Marines that were over in Afghanistan. They do 110 degrees. You have seven to eight guys in one of these armored personnel carriers laying on top of each other. My wife can't stand if I get within three inches of her and she's hot. They lay and fall asleep right on each other, funk and all, in the dirt, out there for days, drinking water that is not cold. Okay? And they're not bathing. The smell inside of a metal container, cooking men in their funk, and I don't know if I could even sleep. And they fall asleep, and they get used to it. But then they come home, and things change. When you come in here, are you accustomed to your funk? Have you become so saturated in the filth of the world that you've become nose blind, nose deaf, pick it? No, not don't pick your nose, just pick which reference you want. <clears throat> so why would then a service go too long? How could Pastor Chuck ever worship too long? Well, the singing was just, oh, there's so much singing in it. Just, just, I don't just, just, just sing, just, just preach. But this is the singing. Do you know what heaven is all about? 
you're going to be worshiping for all eternity. Okay? Now, the Bible says in his presence is fullness of joy. The Bible says in his presence he changes you. Do you realize you need to be changed or have you all hit a certain level of fullness that I can now, of course, brag about my apostleship over you? Has anyone here hit a level of perfection that I can, of course, show you off to God? Because, see, God did that to Job, and we saw how that went down. So, I mean, if you're up for it, I'll throw you under the bus. Has anyone here hit a level of perfection yet? No? Okay, so then see what I'm saying? You're going to probably need me. That's why you need this staff. You need these pastors. You need to be in the presence. You need to be around the church. This is what you, this is God established it that way. This idea that all I need is the Bible and the Holy Spirit is not in the Bible. It's not in here. He's not coming back for an individual who makes choices led by the Holy Spirit. He's coming back for his body who works together. Till you all come together is what the Bible says. Are you with me? So, realize you cannot reconcile people groups together outside of the power or influence of the great reconciler. Let me get culturally relative. Laws do not stop racism. Protests, riots, burning of buildings, spitting on police, will not stop racism. Sit-ins won't stop racism. Threats won't work. The only thing that reconciles people together is change in their heart that comes from knowing Jesus as their personal Savior, and that's it. And I defy anyone to historically show me any different. I'll give someone, and you were watching me, I'll give you $10,000. That's not the point. I won't lose. <laughs> I'll borrow it from Ken. He had it. I'll give anybody 10 grand if they can show me historically a time in the world where there was total peace outside of Jesus Christ and the Lord dominating the planet. Name a time when there were no wars in, in, on the planet. Outside of Adam and Eve... It has never happened. Why? Because once you go outside of the reconciler, you will not find reconciliation. That's how it works. Yes, I see that hand. See, people are happy, happy with half, half of something. something. Right, and that's where I got the word that I was like enjoying the halfness of God, still enjoying my life instead of loving the fullness of God and enjoying what he has for my life. The halfness of Christ is what he preaches. preach. That's how you grow a big church, is you only preach 50%. And what 50% do you preach? That part that doesn't involve sin. You only preach mercy, grace, and love. Never address sin. If you never address sin and you only preach the 50%, you can have an 80,000 person church. As long as you blame somebody else, as long as you don't cause anyone to be accountable for their actions by what you're preaching, as long as you never talk about hell, you never talk about sin, you never talk about the blood, you never talk about what it costs for you to make heaven, and you just preach heaven, love, encouragement, encouragement, encouragement to you, your church will be massive along with laser light shows and a band that's rocking. And that's how it works. But if you preach the fullness and you cause people to realize what it costs 
for you to have access to heaven, then your church is a little more challenged. So, to come together in the unity of the faith, which is God's desire for mankind, not just the church, God gave apostles, pastors, prophets, teachers, and evangelists, Ephesians 4.11. You need me to help you. You need each other to help each other. You cannot do it with just the Bible and the Holy Spirit alone. Solo scriptoria only involves the truth of the word, saying that it is within itself containing the truths of what I just said. People think solo scriptoria means that they worship the book. The book will not get you into heaven. The one who wrote it will. God's parameters are outlined in the book. God's parameters are not the book. Because the book of Acts never had an ending. God says, my sheep hear my voice. That means he's still talking. Do you understand what I'm saying? Today you got a little Latin, you got a little Greek. You're getting your money's worth. So I hear this person say to me once, you can't legislate morality. That's exactly what morals are. Morals are a set of laws to live by. So that was a pretty ignorant statement. But what I think they meant was society can't make people moral through a legislative process. Now that's true. How many people here know there's a speed limit on the expressway? How many people have broken that speed limit by choice? Well, the rest of you by accident. There's a, this is the liars club today. All right. <laughs> You're like, we're on camera. <laughs> Facial recognition. I'm not playing that game. People who are outside of God will eventually fall into immorality when they feel that they can rationalize their actions as a probable choice. Let me repeat that. People who are outside of the influence of the reconciler are not under the influence of Jesus Christ will eventually, say eventually, fall into some form of immorality. When they feel they can rationalize their actions as a probable choice, that will relieve their stress that they feel is a need. How many people during this COVID-19 thing ate more than they should have besides myself? How many people realize that you eat past your need? You will actually eat to your want, thinking it's a need, and that's why people who struggle with their weight can't differentiate because they're so used to fulfilling their wants that they don't know the difference between their wants and their needs. A man my size needs about 1,900 calories, 2,000. When you're not moving around, I don't need so much. But there's something about TV and eating together. Who knows what I'm talking about? Has anyone ever gone to the movie theater and been able to enjoy the movie without eating popcorn? It's a heck of a challenge, personally, for me. It's kind of the two have got to go together because eventually you've got to have the exciting part scare you where you <gasps> suck it in and get a kernel stuck in your throat or you haven't really had the movie experience. Who knows what I'm saying here? Do we have anyone else here who's been there? And, <gasps> and then, you know, because then you join the action in the scene as you try to... I'm sorry, I just got distracted. So you're eventually going to fall into a level of immorality. You're going to go too far. You're going to eat too much. You're going to drive too fast. You can never have too much chocolate. I'm sorry, that's just a rule. Thank you. The Bible says that the heart is desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17, 9. Therefore, there needs to be a change in the heart to bring forgiveness and reconciliation, and that only comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, it doesn't happen any other way permanently. You can go for a while. How many people have ever tried to stop swearing? You know, you, you try to stop swearing, and you do all right, until you drop a five-pound weight on your foot. And you ever notice how quickly it just comes back? Or someone cuts you off on the road while you're not paying attention, while you have a hot coffee in your hand, and you spill it on your lap. 
and it comes back so quickly. I would love to be able to remember some of the stuff I have studied at the speed that I can remember some of the bad words that I could use. And I'm not really a swearing person. I, I don't know. I just never really, that was never my thing. But, but I'm not going to say it's never happened. It has. You will fall back to the area of least resistance because we're made up of between 68 and 80% of water. Water always goes to the area of least resistance. So then you have to have a change in your essence in order to not come back to the characteristics of what you are. So water is made up of steam, it's liquid, and it's solid. You can morph them, but in their essence, they're still just water, right? So you have to actually do something to the water molecules, the H, the 2, and the O. You have to change those molecules in order for it to be something else. Are you following me? You can't change water unless there is some sort of reaction to it. You can add to it. You can change it into mist. You can change it into hard. You can add flavors to it. You can add colors to it. But it's still water. Something has to change in the core in order for it to be something else and not respond the same. Jello will do the same thing as water will. If you add gluten to water, you make gelatin. Now, you put it into a vase... And over time, it will form to the vase, just not as quick. But it still is what it is. People are, well, I'm not changing so quickly to back to what I want. Just give it time. Time and the pressure of the atmosphere will cause you to conform, even if you add gelatin to it. It will still become the very thing that you poured it out of. Are you with me? Are you following what I'm saying? So there has to be a change. And the only way you can change mankind, sorry ladies, is through Jesus Christ. No matter how nice you are and how pretty you are and how like, just, oh, every man just needs to change, you need to, no. Men would be fixed by now with all the women that are on the planet. I think we're still two to one. You, there's two women for every one. We'd be straight and men are still a hot mess. So it takes a God to change a man. Okay? So follow me now. Turn with me to Luke 17, 1. Because I want to get this in. Any questions? Okay. 17, 1. It says, Then he said to the disciples, It's impossible, say impossible, that no offense will come to you in your life, but woe to whom it comes. In other words, they will be dealt with. Why is it impossible not to experience an offense? Because we live in a world that is sin-sick, full of people who are sin-sick. But look at verse 3. It says, Take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, seven times in a day, and he returns and he says, I repent, you're to forgive him. Period. Period. Exclamation point. No adenendum. No see the side notes. You do. If you're a Christian, that's it. I don't really like this hardcore stuff where it's so... Is there room here for a wiggle room? No. Well, I don't like that. I understand completely. It is what it is. Yes. You want to live in forgiveness, but that's a different message. But yes. Now watch this. Take heed or watch yourself. Watch ourselves from what? I'll show you what. If someone offends you, Matthew 18, 15 through the rest of the chapter. It's all right, I'll wash my hands. It's COVID-19. I do it like every 30 seconds nowadays. So you're going to stop it. Um, Matthew says in 18, 15 and following, how to handle if you have to forgive someone. Are you saying that the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, the basic instructions before leaving earth manual, actually tells me how to follow Jesus? 
Yes. He covers it. And he says this. There's a protocol on how to handle it. But why? Now this is why he says you must get rid of unforgiveness. Lest a root of bitterness rise up. A root of bitterness is where you take that offense and you hold it against that person. Thank you. And in so doing, it begins to eat you up inside. Bitterness is like a cancer. Okay? Now, the Bible says when you're saved, you're to produce spiritual fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. Remember, I told you about how He invested in you. Bitterness will stop that growth. And you will not come into the fullness of Christ. So, Hebrews 12, 15 says, Take heed to yourself, lest any man fall or fail the grace of God, lest in grace is an ability to do something. How will you not be able to forgive? Because you've let a root of bitterness spring up and trouble you, and therefore you are defiled. Defiled means filthy. You're bringing filth into the common union. You're dirty. You're funky. And you will actually become accustomed to bitterness. It can become part of your personality and you become nose blind and or deaf to your own filth because you just all of a sudden will start hanging around other bitter people and you'll call it normal. I went to a deaf school. I don't know if you can say that. Hearing impaired, what's the word? Either way. Hearing challenged. What are this? Whatever. And I went to this school and they literally had a culture of deafness. It was its own culture. They were like their own people. They were their own race. And they would talk about hearing people and make fun of them. True biz. They would cheat during tests because... The professor didn't know sign language, and so you'd see him under the table. And I'm like, hey, 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 hey. Hey, 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 hey. And if you got a cochlear implant, which is a thing where they put it in your skull and you can hear again, they ostracized you that you were no longer a part of the culture. They actually said it was wrong for you to try and change the way you were born as a deaf person and they would push you out and they would ostracize you if you decided to get a cochlear implant. You had to stay deaf with them. And they didn't think anything of the fact they couldn't hear. They actually reveled in it. We can do the same thing with our sin. You've heard people brag about their sin. It's a part of the culture. And then how many people here found that as soon as you got saved and you got your cochlear implant you can now start to hear the very voice of God, then you get kicked to the curb. Are you following me? So quickly. To avoid this, it says, go to the offender and rebuke them. So, let me help you. If you are a person who is non-confrontational, you can't be a Christian. Let's just put this stuff out here. We got way too many people lying. Too many pastors, so-called pastors, so-called teachers are lying to people. Well, if, you, if you're shy, you don't have to follow the Bible. If you don't like confrontation, you don't have to do what the Bible says. If hanging on a cross is uncomfortable, it don't work that way. Well, why would God allow me to be, why do I have to be confrontational if it's not my personality? Because your personality is not the personality that's supposed to be living. You're supposed to be representing the personality of Christ. It's no longer I who lives. Has anyone seen someone laying in a casket and said, they have an incredible personality. No, they're dead. There is no personality. 
So if you're dead in Christ, then you and your personality ceases to be priority number one. That should be manifested. It should be the manifestation of Christ. And Christ was very confrontational. Read some of the stuff he said to people. You whitewashed sepulcher, you brood of vipers, you're of your father, the devil. Look it up. You can't go where I'm going. I'm going to the Father. Well, then, if there's only going to the Father and the other place, what did he just say? He walked up to people, repent. He walked up to one woman, and he said, go get your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. He said, sweetheart, you not only have no husbands, you've got five husbands. Hey! He put her on blast. A woman came up to him who was from another color, and she said, would you heal my daughter? And he says, I don't take my power and give it to the dogs. This week on Racists. I know people hate this part of when you actually teach them what the Bible says. I don't like it. I want the happy Jesus story. Everyone wants to stay in Matthew like three. Just talk about baby Jesus in the manger and get us ready for Christmas, would you? And the reason, of course, Jesus said that and said something racist was because he was trying to prove a point. Because he was showing this woman's heart had nothing to do. She wouldn't be so silly as to take an offense at what Jesus was dishing out because her love for her daughter transcended her love for herself. So she didn't care about the racist statement. She just knew that this man could fix her daughter. But those people don't live in, on this planet anymore. They don't exist. And I'm not pro-racism at all. I'm trying to show you his spiritual principle, her priority. He spoke to the fact that she loved her daughter more than herself. And that's what he honored. She didn't love her culture. She loved her daughter. You can call me anything you want to, but I'm going to take care of my child. How to Shrink a Church in Three Easy Steps. My book's almost done. You need to confront people who offend you, address the issue, and look to be reconciled with that person. Don't just tell them off. Then look to build relationship back. That's your job. And especially if they're in the church. Because God is not coming back for a bifurcated bride, a split personality bride. He's not coming for, he's coming for a unified bride. He's coming for those who are part of the unity of the faith till they all come together in the unity of the faith. God will give apostles, pastors, prophets, teachers until you all come together. And I, we're not going to disappear until you all are unified. That's what the Bible says. I'm a Bible preacher. You come here. I'm assuming you want to hear. I can preach other stories. I can tell you stories. Luke 17, 5. Then Jesus told him, his disciples, forgive that person up to seven times a day. They said, increase our faith. Because they knew that only through increased faith can you accomplish this level of ministry to overcome offense. Because you, some of you folks here have been really hurt. It will take a supernatural infusion of the power of God to forgive some of the people who have done things to you. You don't have it in you. You're right. You don't. You do not. But he does. And you're not to live by you. You're to live by him. Now, we expect the unsaved person to have trouble with forgiving. But what's shocking to me is that people in the church who have been forgiven by God, yet they struggle to forgive. Which makes no sense whatsoever. That is totally mentally not there. So turn with me to Luke 7.39 and we'll show you why I say that. You know, I talk with a few other pastors. I have a few pastor friends that really stand for the word of God. Pastor Daly is here and his lovely bride. He will tell you, I hang out with people who don't compromise. And slowly we're realizing 
There's not as many of us as we thought. All you have to do is turn on the TV and watch some of these TV preachers and we're like, ooh. Luke 7.39, it's the story of the woman with the alabaster box who wiped Jesus' feet with her hair after pouring this expensive oil on his feet. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself and said, this man, if he were a prophet, would know what manner of woman who's touching him, for she's a sinner. The word there is the word promiscuous. She was a hoe. A whore, if you want to read King James. And Jesus said to him, I have something to say to you. Now, this is interesting. The man didn't say it out loud. He said it in his head. And Jesus, walking in the Spirit, heard the man speak in his head. He supernaturally knew what the man was saying. And if you read the Scriptures, he does it a lot. But that's another message. He says, uh, I got something to ask you. And, and he goes, well, go ahead. He says, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other owned 50 denarii. And when they had nothing with them to repay it, he freely said, I forgive you both. Tell me which one of them will love the creditor more? And Simon said, I suppose the one who was forgiven more. Right? And he said to him, you've rightly judged. So judging is biblical, and you're supposed to, because he just told him, you're rightly judged. So the judgment was correct, because John 7.24 says that we are to judge, but we've got to judge righteously. So this Pharisee was correct in his judgment, but not in his righteousness. For look what Jesus says. Now stay with me. Verse 47, Therefore I say unto you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. She realized she was a whore. She realized she was promiscuous. She realized that she deserves to go to hell. But because she loved Jesus, she was willing to sacrifice for him. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. I believe one of the reasons many people in the church struggle to forgive or being forgiven is maybe they don't really have the proper assessment of what level of whore you really are. Murderer. Gossip. Pick something. All sins are the same, right? You think you're good. She at least was real about it. She realized, oh, I deserve to go to hell for what I've done. And because Jesus forgave her, there was this massive love. So the Pharisee judged correctly, but why did he not judge righteously? Because he didn't judge her in love. He judged her out of self-righteousness. He said, she deserves to be stoned. She's a whore. And you, a holy man, shouldn't even be associating with her. And Jesus said, you're absolutely correct. He did it to another woman. They caught her actually in the act of having sex, which leads me to how do you catch someone actually in the act unless they were looking? So shouldn't they have been caught for voyeurism? A bunch of old Jewish guys looking at you while you're doing it, you know? The Bible, they indicate that she was literally nude. They grabbed her to shame her and drew her nude right out of the bed that she was having sex with some man and threw her at Jesus' feet and he said, throw the first stone. Does that mean that he condoned her behavior? Absolutely not. He said, you're right, she should be stoned. She should be killed for what she's doing. But before you do that, before you pass judgment on her, the first person that has never committed a sin can throw the first stone. So judge her, but make sure you judged yourself first. He's not condoning. I had someone say, well, see, it says right here, see, and he didn't, so it's all good. No, because he told that woman, don't you ever do that again. He was quite intense. So watch this. People don't realize how bad hell is. 
people don't realize how bad they are outside of Jesus, how bad sin is. Okay? But maybe they felt they weren't so bad, so Jesus is just... I find that people who claim to be saved, who come to church, they don't realize how bad they are, so they're just... Well, they're saved, but it's like a little upgrade to their less than. They weren't a full brome. They were the basic car. They weren't the XL. They weren't the turbo version. They just put a little turbo on them. Otherwise, they're pretty solid. Listen, y'all are a bunch of rat rods. That's for our car people in the back. This false presupposition of an unregenerated self may be why some folks struggle to forgive. They don't think that they're that bad. But look at what Jesus said. He said her love for him was the thing that caused her to be forgiven and what Simon the Pharisee lacked in order to forgive. If you really do love God, no matter what was done to you, your love will transcend the hurt that person did to you. Otherwise, you may not be saved. That is what it says. I mean, is everyone, you have the same, does everyone have the same? It's right here, page uh, 1643. So it's a pharisaical Christian, the religious, I'm not that bad believer that struggles to forgive at the level we've been called to based on a false appreciation for what Christ has truly done for them. So what I'm saying is faith alone is not enough to enact the ministry of reconciliation and forgiveness and claim Christ in your fullness. You're half in it. Half step in. Someone must also have an intense love for God based on the realization of how much Jesus loves us to save us from ourselves. See, faith and intense non-religious love are key to bringing forgiveness and reconciliation to the world, not laws and protests. All these people out there running over the fact that George Floyd died. That is a terrible thing. I hope they punish the guy who did it. End of story. I don't care who he was, what he did. What they did was dead wrong. Period. How people have responded since then has accomplished nothing. Except tear down neighborhoods and cause more division so that, of course, those that are in power can keep us divided so they can conquer us and eventually we will salute the new flag. Wake up. It's in the book. Read Daniel, read Thessalonians, read the book of Revelation. End of story. I wish that the people who are out protesting and rioting and all of this other, and we won't call it rioting because that's probably racist, protesting with tremendous vigor. Um, I wish they were that excited about leading people to Jesus because if they were out preaching the gospel in that massive, with that fervor, it would literally ab 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 abolish racism. If all these country, all these cities with these highly intelligent mayors who want to get rid of the cops... And guns. They're just, I, I don't know how much weed people smoked when the generation just before this, but it left such a retardation, a mental illness, a, a problem for the children that are born today. Hello, there's someone breaking into my house. Do you have a gun? No. Good luck. And I've dealt with bad cops. I've dealt with good cops. The difference? Give one a donut. No, that's so, that's racist. That's, that's against the police race because there's police, everyone's got a race. You know, there's the bald race and then it used to be just the human race, but now we we're bifurcated. We had Italian race and I've had bad experiences with police officers and I was not in the wrong. I was sharing, I, I worked in Minneapolis. 
I arrested someone who was a shoplifter, and I went into a dark alley, and that person was not my pigment. And I handcuffed him. And they came in, and they said, let's tune this guy. And they used a, a racial slur towards him. And they grabbed him, and they pulled on the handcuffs, my handcuffs, on his wrists. And he fell down, and he took the skin off of his knees, and they said, we're going to tune this. And they used that word again, and I said, hold it. I don't play like that. I'm not a racist. I took my handcuffs off, and I said, that is not my prisoner. I didn't do that to him, and I will not take responsibility for it. Will I be connected to any of racist ways? And that was in Minneapolis, and there were two of them, and they weren't pigmented. So yes, they exist even in Minneapolis. Does that mean that every cop is that way? No. Because, see, to say that is being bigoted, and I thought we're rioting about being bigoted. No more bigots, but I'm going to be bigoted. So you you can't be bigoted, but I can be bigoted and burn my neighborhood down, and that'll change the world. Because Jesus said, go and burn down your neighborhood in protest, and you'll all go to heaven. Even though that's never helped. How does Detroit look since 42 or the riots of 67? The same. Want to go for a ride with me? It accomplishes nothing. The only thing that changes mankind is Jesus Christ. Protesting. Then what are we going to do? Well, we're going to make it illegal to kill people of other colors. Well, we already have that on the books. Yeah, but we're going to We're going to make it specific only to black people. That's also on the books. It's a hate crime. It's already on the books. Well, we're going to, it's wrong for cops to kill. It's on the books. We have already have all the legislation we need against racism, and it isn't working. Why? Because only Jesus Christ changes the hearts of man. Think about it all. I watch this thing and I'm thinking, my goodness, look at the fervor and the screaming and the spitting and ah, ah. And I'm thinking, if they were that excited about Jesus, what would have changed? But then what do I know? I'm, I'm white. <laughs> Which is racist, by the way. Because all white people aren't alike. She's from Ireland. She's from, he's from Holland. Are you saying that Dutchmen are the same as German? We'll punch you in the eye if you say that. You can always tell a Dutchman. You just can't tell him much. But if you're not Dutch, you're not much. Ask us. We'll tell you. It's the Dutch way. But if you make us mad, we're Irish, and we'll just give you a little pop right in the eye. We will. I'll tell you. The luck of the Irish, you know. So watch this. Faith and intense love for Christ brings reconciliation to the world because it spreads like COVID-19 only faster. And you don't have to have social distance. You actually are supposed to be included close enough in the church and often. Like going to Walmart every time because you feel shut into your house and you don't need anything, but you can't stand being in your house, so you're going to go to Walmart again for the sixth time that day because you're losing your mind staying inside and you've walked around your neighborhood and you don't even like your neighbors and their dog keeps barking at you anyways. It's like Groundhog Day every day. So let me show you something. Remember Jesus said about the 500 denarii? Well, watch this. And the 300 denarii. Watch this. An intense love sacrifices tremendously for the one that they love. Scholars believe that the jar that this woman had was very expensive. Not just the spikenard, not the liquid inside, but it was very expensive oil that it contained. Most scholars estimate the cost of the ointment to be about Three to 500 denarii. What was the parable that he just said about 500 denarii? Okay, watch this. That is 54,509 U.S. dollars. She took 54G, 54K. That is the total cost of the liquid and the container. 
and she, it says she broke the container. Broke it and poured this out. She lavished it and let it dr drizzle all over his feet under the floor. Then she took her own hair and she wiped it. She didn't bring a towel. $54,000 for two minutes with the Savior. And we flip out if the preacher preaches too long or the song service goes too long. $54,000 to grease up a man's feet. How, how much do you think she, you, she realized how bad off she was? She didn't pour a little. What if she poured it out for everyone she had sex with outside of marriage? Maybe she got 12 drops down. Now this lady must have been with everybody in the neighborhood because she bust that whole thing right on her. Or maybe she knew it wasn't even about how many times. Maybe she understood the cost of sin. And so she took everything. $54,000. The average person's yearly wage. Yet it's hard to come to too many services and the preacher goes too long and the music is too loud or Pastor Chuck sings too much or I've got a lot going on and you don't know how hard I've been and what they've done to me. And $54,000 for two minutes with the Savior. How long do you think it'd take for her to wipe her hair? Because immediately this guy starts talking. Jacked up her whole scene. Here she's trying to have a moment. And there's this guy over there immediately as she's trying to do something for God. Well, you could have spent that a little different. There's always the religious people. They always think they have to have an opinion. They can't just shut up. He knew how much that cost. He was hung up on the fact she was a whore. For real? This woman is going above and beyond, dude. Yes, but if he was truly a man of God, he made it about him to make it about him. Do you understand what I just said? He made it about Jesus allowing this woman to touch him because he was offended. How many people get offended for God? Let me tell you something. And I, again, with the apologetics things, I like apologetics and everything, but God doesn't need your help to be defended. In the twinkling of an eye, he can turn us into dust. Some people want to fight, and we want to stand, and we want to stand against what's wrong, and we want to stand. I think God is calling the church to stop standing against what's wrong and start standing facing Christ and be transformed. Now, I'm not saying we go light on sin. I'm not saying we don't deal with problems that are going on in the world. But I, if we were more like Jesus, do you think that the world would be as bad as it is? If the church was representing Christ like it should, but now since we haven't been doing what we're supposed to, now we're going to go and get involved in social things to try and fix up what would have been fixed if we would have just been following Jesus all along. I was going to go someplace, but I'm, I'm trying to... I ah, forget it. Do um, you know the problem with becoming obese and having diabetes is that you can't exercise to lose the weight to get rid of the disease? It becomes very, very hard. So you have to do other things to try to get yourself to a place of sustainability. But if you would have just been dieting and taking care of yourself all along, it isn't that hard. But with diabetes, then you end up having sores. Then from sores, then they don't heal. And so then it's harder. And then you can't exercise longer because you have to wait till this heals and it takes longer. And meanwhile, you're gaining more weight. And eventually, it just becomes this whole... And that's what's happening to the church. 
We're not doing what we were supposed to in the very beginning, being disciplined and taking care of ourselves and doing the things that Jesus said. So now we're going to rush around and try and get involved in social issues and try and fix things and try and do what's good instead of doing what's God. And if we would have been doing God all along, we wouldn't have to do what's good because God trumps good. Protest. They have a right. No one has a right to protest, to burn, to whatever, if they're a Christian, because dead people don't have rights. The Bible says that you, up, you give up your rights for his will. And what is his will? Matthew 28, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Cast out devils, heal the sick, baptize people. Can you imagine a thousand people in a city going around actually leading people to the Lord, laying hands on them properly instead of throwing them to the ground and fighting with them? What kind of miracles would have happened if this united front against racism would have actually used it to evangelize and get rid of racism? When I had my hip replaced, some people came over to help me put in a fence. They had this thing, an auger. I don't know if it's an auger, but so I crank it up and digs a hole. I set it down, and when I did, it rolled over, and the muffler burned my leg, and I got a, almost a third-degree burn on my leg. I had just had hip replacement surgery 10 days earlier. Oh, no big deal. Three days earlier, I was painting this place with my hip out to here like Nicki Minaj <laughs> on a walker. And I burned my leg severely. It was bad. I should have went to the doctor, but I had just left the doctor. I didn't feel like going back. And as a man, if you walk it off, it goes away. So I figure I'll just put a little cream on it and cover it up. Fix the burn, right? Right? So I get, I, I'm talking to my doctor, and we're friends. He's talking on the phone, and I said, yeah, you know, he's like, how you doing? I said, well, you know, the hips bothered me and stuff. And, and uh, he said, so I said, well, I'm working on a house. He said, you're working on a house? I said, yeah, I work on a house. I said, but man, I burned myself with a muscle. I said, it's pretty bad. I said, but don't worry about it. I put some, I put some cream over it, and, and I, he goes, what? I go, well, I put some cream over it. I'm sure it'll be fine. He goes, what, what's wrong with you? Don't. Don't practice medicine if you don't know medicine. He says you heal a burn from the inside. You don't heal it from the outside. He says that infection, that can get infected, and because you just had your hip replaced, you are highly vulnerable to infection. So he had to put me on really strong antibiotics. I could have died because I was trying to fix the burn of racism from the outside instead of from the inside. And so all these Black Lives Matter people are trying to practice a medicine that they don't even know the cure to. They don't have the knowledge. They're trying to handle it from the outside. It's an inside thing. And the infection will spread. We have a lot of white people. And how many white people here have, since they've seen this protest and everything, um, have heard other white people say how they're going to give up racism. Has anyone come to you and say, man, I'm ready, I'm ready to give up my racist views? Is it? Anybody say, you know, anybody? I didn't hear it from anybody. Because it won't change what only Jesus can change. Only Jesus. He's the only hope for humanity. Don't heal a burn. From the outside, you heal it from the inside. There are those who read this about 54,500 and they're thinking, well, then there are people here who think that 10% is, I'll leave it alone. So since we've been talking about the topic of help my Christianity isn't working, 
If you're singing and attending and tithing and giving and you don't sense the reciprocity of the Spirit of God and the favor of God, then further testing of your faith needs to be done even though you feel you're asymptomatic. You might need to get retested if you are still holding on to a position in which you're doing everything right but you're not receiving the benefits thereof. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Examine yourselves whether you are in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you. And if you don't know for sure, you will be a reprobate. So what are we supposed to examine? I mean, seriously, what what are we examining here? When When you come in, what is he talking about? What are you examining? You examine the heart. Now, I know a lot about medicine, but obviously not about burns. I do now. So we're going to do a little heart surgery today, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to tell you and explain to you what I learned from my friend who's a doctor. Because since this COVID-19 thing has happened, I almost have a doctorate in medicine. Because while I'm working out, he is going bananas about how people are reacting to this COVID-19 thing. More people are dying from other things than COVID-19 right now at a record rate, and you don't hear about it. I know how the COVID as a virus has to attach to a bacteria, and it has to have an RN factor, and in so doing, it then mutates. It takes on a symbiotic relationship so that that bacteria actually becomes possessed of an evil thing that overcomes the body. Oh, this sounds familiar. I saw it. I read... So here's how the heart works. Watch. Matthew 5, 8. It says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The word there, pure, is the word cathartic, where we get the word catheter. Now, what does a catheter do? Well, there's two kinds of catheters I know. We won't get involved with the lower one. We'll stick to the top one but they work the same. A catheter's job is to drain out all the impurities of what's there. If you are catheterized before surgery, you're going to have a little bag, they're going to collect your urine, they're going to test to see if you have any sort of whatever in it. You can also have a heart catheter and it does the same thing. Its job is to expel any impurities in the heart. So a pure heart is a catheterized heart that expels the impurities and unforgiveness so that bitterness does not grow there. Because if you allow blood that has, has, has been tainted to sit within the heart, it can congeal. And when it congeals, it becomes a blood clot to which it plugs then the veins. And when the blood doesn't go through your body, that's not good. I don't know if you know that, but trust me, I'm a doctor. just not of burns. Blessed are those who push out or irrigate their heart of impurities, who don't allow offenses no matter how heinous the impurities are, lest bitterness grow because you will not see God. So for those of you who are saying, he's just so intense, what does it say? Read the book. If you hold unforgiveness, You're not going to heaven. And the amens are deafening. I feel like a dentist today. I don't have any... uh. Poke, 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 poke. I hate this church. All he does is just point out things that could kill me. Just tell me I'm fine. Give me a sucker. Send me on my way. You're not doing this right at all. My bad. God will bless those with a pure heart. He will respond to their sacrifices, their tithe, their praise, their offering. Those who keep their heart catheterized or pure, you will find a benefit. The reason your Christianity isn't working, is it possible because you're not working your Christianity? The reason you don't find the benefits to being a Christian is because you're still holding on to unforgiveness, but you're singing and you're giving and you're reading your Bible and occasionally you talk to a homeless person and throw them five bucks and you stop being racist uh, uh, and you stop swearing and you stop doing all of these things and you're still, your life is because God says, I'm sorry. 
but your heart's not right. That's Christianity. Anybody else tells you any different, they're a liar, bring them to me, I'll say it to their face. See, I'm going for broke, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm reading the writing on the walls, and I don't want to have it say, Tiko Tiko Eupharsin, and says, you've been found in the balance and found wanting as the Persian king, okay? I'm not into that. When he writes on my wall, I want to have him say, well done, good and faithful servant, and I'm going to be ready when he comes, because he's coming. If you think we're not in the end times, you smoke enough pot, even if it's legal, to actually make yourself deluded. Now would be the time to be paranoid. Smoke the weed that gets you paranoid. Be concerned, very concerned. He's coming back. What was that? I don't know. It's the cops. No, we disbanded them. Oh my gosh, what was that anyways? So what's God saying? Is he's saying stop looking for him to put you in a world or a relationship or a church where there are no offenses. That is like going to a hospital where you're going to find no sick people. That doesn't exist. Hospitals aren't built so that no one goes in them. Churches are built so people go in them and get healed. Woman comes in pregnant. She's about she's in labor. The doctor goes, well, I'm going to have to. No, I don't want you to see it. But I, I, but I have to, uh, it's, uh, no. It'll fall out. I'll hide the fact that has anyone you cannot successfully hide labor. I've been at a lot of births. You know something's going on. Or this woman is really mad about something. About the same. Depending on how long. The problem is this. We read, blessed are the pure in heart. But the problem is that we have a juvenile church, an immature position, because pastors keep preaching milk and can't understand no one is maturing when it says it takes strong meat. I'm the butcher. Welcome to the meat market. And no, I will not tenderize it for you in my own mouth and spit it into your mouth like little birds. I expect you to take it home and cook it for yourself and chew on it. This is not the oatmeal factory. You're going to need the strength of strong meat with what is coming down the pike. You better smell what the rock is cooking. Lord, I just want them to go away. <laughs> There's so much wine going on in the church, you'd think we were Mogan David. They're so hard on me. They're so rough. God, my life is hell. God says, wait till you don't forgive. Then you'll really know what hell is. If you don't like it the way it is right now, you want to avoid this and for all eternity, forgive. Because it only gets worse from here. Chapter 2 of my book on how to shrink a church. God will not change the world. Protests will not change the world. Riots will not change the world. Laws will not change the world. Drugs won't change the world. Jesus will destroy the world.
So then what's the point, preacher? He's not looking to change the world. He's looking to change us to then be used by him to give people in the world a chance before he destroys this thing completely. Look it up. When he comes back, he has no sense of humor. Read the book of Revelation. Just read it. Read it. You don't want to be here. One third of all water will be turned into blood. One third of all of the vegetation will be consumed. And if you think it's hot in the summer, he's going to blot out things and then he's going to make things. If you think you've been near an earthquake or tornado, you should see what's coming next. When he comes, there will be plagues way worse than COVID-19. He's going to come and he's going to be very angry. And rightfully so. Because he said, I told you all to get along on this globe. And instead you chose racism. I told you to be fruitful and multiply and instead you kill your babies and say it's a woman's choice. You're greedy, you're whiny, you're complainy, and you don't appreciate what I did for you. And you thought you could do it on your own. And the Bible says he will smite the earth and consume it, and men will bite their tongues and call out for the mountains to fall on them and crush them because there'll be no place to hide. The conclusion to my book, the truth of the gospel, get saved or go to hell. 66 books to say that. 1,500 years, multiple continents, Get saved or go to hell. It took all of this to say that. I got a degree and a doctorate just to say that. I have to think up of new ways to say that. 52 times, times two. And if I get invited out to speak somewhere else. A simple message. Now listen to me. There is an arbitration clause in most business relationships. It says we are in the business relationships, but offenses will come. The Christian, it's Matthew 18, as I mentioned, lays out how to resolve a conflict and still stay in relationship. Now the Bible says to whom much is given, much is required, Luke 12, 48. So if you want increase and blessings in your life, in your ministry, in your relationship, if you want to be given much, you have to be able to handle offenses correctly. You will not grow as a person, as a ministry, as a pastor if you can't handle forgiveness. And as of late, I've been called to set the example. God won't give you more than you're willing to handle. Did you hear what I just said? But he will give you more than you're willing to handle. We have been given the word of reconciliation. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We are required to forgive and to seek reconciliation for that's our ministry, our mandate, and the main modus operandi of who we claim to emulate when we call ourselves Christians. It is not an option. It's not an option. Look at your neighbor and tell him it's not an option.
you don't have a choice in the matter if you want to go to heaven. I wonder if TBN will be calling me so I can preach this on TV. You cannot miss out on what God has for you over what has ever happened to you. If you do, you validate the person who did that to you. If you think they were low-life scum, and I'm not going to forgive them, that, that means then that you have actually validated them and you have become like them because you gave credence to what they did. I told you I saw a movie years ago in which a woman was raped by two men. And they bruised her up pretty good. And they saw her on the street and they began to laugh. And they said, you know what we did to you? She said, if he said, if you ever do what you did, she said, we'll, he'll do, we'll do that to you again. And she turned and she looked at him and she said, you didn't do anything to me. That little soap and water couldn't wash away. I'm still me. You didn't take me. You just did something to my body. But who I am at the core still stands for what I believe in. Do you have it like that? The Bible says you do. The question is, do you want to exercise it like that or do you want to go to hell? My drink is moonshine, ever clear. If you want any beer, there's other places. But it's strong meat, strong drink, because you need to be strong, because what's coming will consume the weak. And I don't want to lose any of you. And if that means I take it on the chin and have to set the example, yay! But it's not an option. When God said, I'm calling you into the ministry, he didn't say, and you have a choice. He said, I made your heart beat. And I created you for such a time as this. And I will tell you, you can have tremendous peace when you realize why you're still on the planet. Some people walk around, I don't know what my purpose is in life. Once you're truly saved and you give your life over to Christ, he'll let you know rather quickly. Pastor Chuck, you struggle with knowing what your job is lately? Mm, pretty solid. Do you always like it? Uh, yes. But what about all the other entrapments? Thank you. See how he didn't answer that? He's always the more political one. Everyone sometimes thinks he's a sucker, like, because I say it out there, he's, he just doesn't say it until you dig at him a little bit. Then you'll find he can cook a steak just as well as me. He just, it's, you know, it's good cop, bad cop. That's how he plays off. I'll do the good cop. We're both cops. So let's pray. Is your hand up or are you just saying amen? I'm so right. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you have to speak, speak up. up. Okay. <clears throat> I want to speak on what you was talking about earlier. This is in Genesis chapter 3. Um, excuse me, because I talk a little funny right now because I have to in my throat. Um, Genesis 3. Far as the sins that's in the world now, I've been new this, but I really see it more clear now. Like how um, how the, the serpent tricked them into eating. How the serpent out of, deceived Eve, yes. Yeah, out of, out, of, out of the garden, whatever. And it looked so good to them, they had to go taste and bite it. The serpent deceived Eve, and Eve gave us her husband. Ooh, I guess she went like this. Come on, baby, let's taste this. You know, you know this look good to you. Come on, honey. Get some of this. He ate. You know what I'm saying? He ate. So therefore, it opened the eyes of everyone. 
And when I say was naked, I observe the, the world seeing everything that they shouldn't have seen. That's right. why it's so wicked now. Right. People killing folks, drinking, smoking, doing all types of things that's right. not just done. Now, if that thing, that thing that never happened, it would just be a peaceful world. We don't have to worry about going to church, studying the Bible, or right. none of this. We don't have to do none of this. We, we, we wouldn't make no one of them. Why we never die? And this is the point. point. Satan, Satan makes, makes what, he what he offers, offers very, very attractive, attractive but does, does not tell, tell you the consequences, consequences for why. Every pimp does that, every drug dealer. No drug dealer goes, would you like to be hooked on heroin? Or do they just say, here, try this. The first one's always free. You'll be back. There is a Pavlovian dog principle that's going on in the world right now. Pavlov would feed a dog, and then ring a bell, and he would collect the saliva from the dog. He trained the dog that all he had to do was ring the bell and didn't have to put the food out. And it cost him nothing to control the dog. What's going on in the world today? People are being controlled like dogs, triggered. If you're triggered by what someone says, you're a dog. I'm not a dog. I don't have to answer to every offense that comes my way. I don't have to redo every post and comment every Facebook page. I don't have to stand up for this and stand up for that. As we come into the end times, pick your battles correctly. Don't waste your energy. If someone does not have the intellect to have a conversation with you at a to on a topic because they're looking for truth. Most people aren't looking for truth. They just want to hear their opinion come out of your mouth to validate their weakness because they don't like hearing themselves talk anymore because it isn't working. So they will pressure you to try to validate their weakness. Don't be a sucker. Don't be a dog. Don't let Pavlov be your master. Allow God to teach you the truth. Yes? <laughs> do you think that God, I mean, God doesn't make mistakes, but do you think that God wanted the story of Jesus, wanted to, uh, not story, wanted to um, have himself in the physical form, in the human form, because um, after he sinned, and then there was sin among the, um, the whole world, they had... Um, great flood. It would have just been a constant repetitious cycle. Everyone's going to sin again. I have to have another flood. So now you have Jesus and there's a second coming and a final um, purging. Purging. Right. Yes. And then heaven on earth. How it's supposed to be in the beginning. Right. right. That is the summation. You know, from her, you know, from what she said. But do you think that that is why this whole thing was a setup? Set up. People think, think that, that Jesus, Jesus came, came like, like, like Adam and Eve sinned, and God was like, oh, smack. Mm. Oh, man. Uh, uh, Jesus. Yes, Father. Uh, the humans, they, uh, they screwed it up. Oh, what are we going to do? I don't know. We need a plan. All right, in about 2,000 years from now, you go down, become a human, get beaten, died, and then we'll fix it then, and then we'll let it go for another 2,000, and then you come back, and we'll snatch up everybody who, who accepts you, and then, and yeah, we'll fix it that way. No. 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 God is never caught off guard. This whole thing of history, and I'll be preaching on this on Sunday, it's his story. This story, he's writing. It's his story. No writer sits down as they go to write a book about something and goes, I don't know, I'm just going to start writing and see what happens. And then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll catch myself off guard in my own thoughts and then fix my thoughts. Those people have mental illnesses. Okay, God knew from the very beginning what he was going to do, why he was going to do it, and how it was going to end. You say, why did he do this? When you get to heaven, you'll have all eternity to ask him that. I want to know why eye boogers, why navel smell, and why mosquitoes. That's where my priorities are. I'm like, what in the world were you thinking, man? 
I mean, seriously, what is the purpose of a mosquito? They don't do anything in the ecosystem except suck your blood. Things I ponder. Any other questions? All right, let's close in prayer. If you would like to support us, you can find us on Simple Give under Covenant Christian Center International. You can write us at 91 Welts, Mount Clemens, Michigan, 48043. I'll answer any questions, of course, that you pose. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. And Lord, you didn't bring us out this far to show us that there was no hope, but that there is hope in you. But there is only one hope. There is only one way. There is only one baptism, one communion, one you made it very simple for us because as human beings, we mess things up. So I'd ask, Lord God, that those that are here would truly make a commitment to you, not only ask you to come into their heart, make them the Lord of their life, but actually they would be regenerated and forgive at the level that you've called them to because it's our job. I pray that you heal the wounds that are here and the people that are hurting. We pray for our nation as it is wounded by the offenses that have been coming through the abuses of people in power and through other evil things, people, institutions, etc. We pray for your protection upon the police department and those good cops who are trying their best, the first responders, lest we forget COVID because we don't want to, of course, forget the latest trauma that's going on. We pray for those who have lost people to that and we pray, Lord God, that you would heal this land. I know full well things are going to get worse. Your Bible says so. But it also says that we don't have to get worse, but we can actually walk in a power that does tremendous good as we represent you. So change us, Lord God, into your image. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Daly and his lovely bride will be 